minimum wage is going up. Workers deserve to have more money in their pockets because they earned it. The Premier announcing the raise to $15 an hour will start on January 1st, six months before the provincial election. Some calling it a political move. Plus... It's really important that you have mental health workers who have the tools and the training to support someone in crisis. As part of its reform, Toronto Police and a local crisis centre officially launched today a pilot project to better assist 911 callers in mental distress. And... Our message today is very simple. Please get your flu shot. The city is bracing for another flu season and urging everyone to get their flu shot. Why this year's flu season is expected to be harsher than the last. Good evening, I'm Kelda Yoon. The Premier has made it official. Ontario's minimum wage will go up to $15 an hour beginning on January 1st. It was supposed to happen almost three years ago, but Doug Ford scrapped the legislation drafted by the previous government when he came into power. Now he's being accused of angling for votes in next spring's election. Lorena Redekop has more. On January 1st, workers will see their wage increase by 65 cents an hour. It'll be a much bigger jump for employees who serve liquor. The government is getting rid of a special minimum wage for them. It's based on an assumption of tips. It means an almost 20% pay raise from $12.55 an hour to $15. I've always said workers deserve to have more money in their pockets because they earned it. But minimum wage was supposed to rise to $15 an hour almost three years ago. We're getting rid of the 148. Premier Doug Ford's government scrapped the legislation brought in by the Liberals. It's a job killer. The Premier insists today things are different. And that's like comparing apples and oranges. We didn't have the pandemic, a worldwide pandemic. Uh, everyone's been facing a challenge over the last 20 months. Things were a lot different back in 2018. Another difference, he was joined today by Labour leaders, who in the past would have been more likely to speak out against the PCs. We had our bumps. Uh, and I said some not so nice things about the Premier on many occasions. Has this government done things that have raised my ire? The answer is yes. But the bottom line is I'm here today understanding that we're having a discussion on minimum wage, recognizing that it's a good start. Some see the announcement as a pre-election gift. The Canadian Federation of Independent Business says it'll be the opposite for some businesses. To add now another cost pressure onto their shoulders, particularly for, for liquor servers, this is giant, giant inflationary pressure on small businesses at a time when many are just hanging on by their fingernails. I, I don't know what they're thinking. Clearly, they're thinking about an election and not the economy. Opposition parties say it's about trying to win over votes from workers. Now the government needs them. The, gov the Premier wants them for his re-election. So he's kind of buying them back with their own money. Liberals and Conservatives have a real bad habit of, uh, of trying to use these uh, workers as political pawns. And it's disrespectful, it's cruel. Given cost increases, the NDP now wants the minimum wage at around $17 or $17.50 an hour. The government says it'll also bring in a wage increase every October tied to inflation. Loretta Radikop, CBC News, Milton. A teen found guilty of sexually assaulting another student at St. Michael's College School in 2018 was sentenced today to two years probation with no jail time. A judge found the teen guilty in June of gang sexual assault, sexual assault and with a weapon and assault stemming from the incident in a locker room at the all boys school. The sexual assault was captured on cell phone video and shared widely on social media before police launched an investigation. The prosecution argued that the accused Hughes' teen should spend three months behind bars for what it called a violent and humiliating incident. But the defense argued the teen should receive a probationary sentence with no jail time, the same as four others who also pleaded guilty in the incident. The Toronto Police Service officially launched today a one-year pilot project that will divert some 911 calls to crisis response workers. Partnering with the Gerstein Crisis Centre, the pilot is in response to calls from mental health advocates for police reform following a number of fatal incidents after officers responded to crisis calls. Del Manukduk has more. 
We are here for 20 hours. The pilot project will see police evaluate 911 calls and, depending on the situation, possibly transfer the call to a Gerstein Crisis Center worker who will be stationed at the TPS call center. As in, there isn't an immediate safety concern. They can, um, with their consent, connect them to a crisis worker who could then provide them with immediate mental health support. The move is a direct response to calls from the mental health community. It's really important that you have mental health workers who have the tools and the training to support someone in crisis, de-escalate them, connect them with appropriate resources. The crisis workers are all trained in mental health, suicide and crisis intervention and de-escalation. It's important for both the Toronto Police and the community because uh, it's a way for us to understand the needs of the community and to serve the community in the way that they want us to. A crisis worker is available 20 hours a day, seven days a week to respond to 911 callers in crisis who meet the no imminent risk criteria. Discussions between the caller and crisis worker are protected. Toronto Police receive over 33,000 mental health calls per year. For many that may include a diagnosis, but it doesn't have to have a diagnosis attached. Um, it may be that they are struggling and feel that they need support around mental health and that's sufficient. The pilot project, which costs more than $500,000 out of the police operating budget, will not have a mobile response unit. So the initial call, the, you know, the crisis worker will spend time with the individual on the phone, but they will also follow up, helping them connect to other resources, as well as just checking in with them over the next few days as that crisis gets resolved. The crisis workers will be serving the communities in 51, 52 and 14 divisions. Dale Minuckduck, CBC News, Toronto. New tonight, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control has approved the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine for use in children between 5 and 11 years old. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration had already decided the drug is safe and effective for children. Now, kids will receive about one-third the amount of vaccine that's given to adults and teens. And they could start getting the shot within days. That's because Pfizer is already packing and shipping the first orders across the U.S. President Joe Biden calls the approval a turning point in the battle against COVID-19. This approval will add 28 million Americans to the list of those eligible for a vaccine. And Toronto has hit a new milestone. 84% of residents are now fully vaccinated against COVID-19. Despite the progress, the city is bracing for another much more difficult flu season. Today, Mayor John Tory was out promoting the city's five newly opened flu vaccine clinics. Greg Ross has more. Our message today is very simple. Please get your flu shot. And to drive that message home, the mayor rolled up his sleeve today to get the flu vaccine. This is something that was happening year after year after year, long before the pandemic, because the flu shots work. They help to keep people healthy in a different respect. The province is preparing for a much harder flu season as compared to last winter, when COVID-19 restrictions were also helpful in preventing the spread of the flu. Every year, there's about 12,000 hospitalizations across Canada and about 3,500 deaths related to influenza. Dr. Alan Grill with the Markham Stouffville Hospital says if we reach those numbers this flu season, coupled with another wave of COVID-19, it will likely once again stretch the health care system in the province to its limits. What we don't want to see is adding to that system capacity strain with influenza. Uh, we want to make sure that we prevent as many cases as possible because we still want to catch up on things like elective surgeries and cancer treatments some of which have been delayed or postponed because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Like the COVID-19 vaccine, the flu shot doesn't completely eliminate the risk of getting influenza, but it does reduce the risk of getting a severe case, particularly for those who are most vulnerable. This is especially true for older individuals, those who are pregnant, as well as younger children. And like the COVID-19 vaccine, the flu shot is free and easy to get. There are three ways the general public can receive their flu vaccine. Through their doctor, at a local pharmacy, or at one of our five Toronto Public Health immunization clinics. The flu shot is available to anyone six months and older, and health officials say it's safe to get both the flu and COVID-19 vaccines at the same time. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. Meteorologist Nick Sternkovich joins us now with a first look at the forecast. And Nick, it's happening. We're starting to talk about flurries in some areas. 
Yeah, Calda, we had temperatures briefly hitting 9 degrees this afternoon and then they fell down to about 5 and that's more or less where we sat through the afternoon hours. And north of the city, as you said, we've actually got some flurries, uh, a little bit of that uh, white stuff falling uh, from the sky. Uh, that's a look at temperatures from this afternoon, but this is what everybody's talking about, especially north of the GTA. Uh, we do have some... Uh, some snow flurries falling and in fact I think through tonight some areas might actually see some accumulating snows. Uh, it's not going to be so much for the City of Toronto. We're expecting to see wet flurries tonight but certainly outside the GTA uh, definitely can make for a bit of a tricky drive tomorrow morning. That continues by the way through the next 24 hours. And speaking of the next 24 hours, zero degrees tonight in the City of Toronto, eight for tomorrow. Again, watch for some slippery road conditions for the morning commute as we get that mixed precipitation. We'll tell you how long that's going to last and where you might see some accumulating snows coming up in just a bit. Thanks so much, Nick. Ontario's transit agency is set to increase trains running through one Toronto neighborhood tenfold, alarming many residents. A train will rumble through Riverside every 45 seconds once Metrolinx expands its GO train service and builds the Ontario line. As Samantha Beatty reports, a new report says the impacts will be detrimental to residents' health. Every seven minutes, trains clatter by this East End Affordable Seniors building. And resident Amanda Bankier is used to accommodating. The possibility will give the GO train a moment to get past. But she says she's not going to be able to cope when 1,800 trains rush by her home each day by 2030. I cannot see going through months or years of construction here and then permanent um, uh, rapid transit uh, at rush hour continuously and pretty frequently the rest of the time. It does seem very unlikely that I could get through that. And there are other people here who are sick. Metrolinx has decided to run the Ontario Line subway and Lakeshore East GO trains along a 1.5 kilometer stretch of tracks through Riverside and Leslieville. It will be one of the only sections to run above ground instead of underground. We have looked at alternative solutions, including uh, an underground um, line, an underground subway line here. Um, but technically, that's it's very difficult to do because there are, there's quite a bit of infrastructure under the ground. The construction time frame to tunnel would mean we would be in the community building the subway for a longer period of time. Instead, they'll build a wall to buffer the almost constant noise of trains. With the noise walls going up, the sound will be equivalent to what you hear today or it'll be even quieter. But some community groups say that's not good enough. They commissioned a health impact assessment, which Metrolinx hasn't done. The report found the underground option is better for residents' stress levels and sleep, and the community's parks that run alongside the rail corridor. The public has been kept out of the decision-making process altogether, and we haven't seen what the, what the design is going to look like, where the stations are going to go. All the substantive decisions have been made somewhere else, and we have only been given a choice over cosmetic things like color of the noise wall, literally, and I don't think that's how we build sustainable transit in 21st century in downtown Toronto. They're demanding the line be buried and for more of a say before Metrolinx breaks ground. Samantha Beatty, CBC News, Toronto. of the Eglinton Crosstown LRT is getting closer to reality. With that snap, crews laid down the last section of track along the 19-kilometer rapid transit line. The last clip installed at Eglinton Station was painted in gold. It's a celebratory moment for the project, which saw construction begin in 2016. The LRT is expected to officially open sometime next year. Welcome back. A music label in Toronto is helping South Asian musicians break through in the industry while helping audiences feel more connected to their roots. Kirtan Asasi Theron sat down with the mind behind the label and some of the artists helping it flourish.
It's when she's singing in Tamil that Navani Phillips says she feels most like her authentic self. I make uh, music in Tamil because that's my mother tongue. And I think it's really important for the younger generation to be proud of their mother tongue because I wanted to make it sound cool, just like, you know, you listen to Spanish music in the radio. <laughs> Philip, who's also known as Navs 47, is part of a new label called Maja, a production house that aims to amplify South Asian musicians and their diverse styles and regional languages. Philip says creating music in Tamil has actually helped inspire young people from the Tamil diaspora to connect with the language. I hear a lot of people saying that, oh, I. I want to learn Tamil because I want to understand your songs better. I think that was the best compliment that I've received so far. Oh, I didn't know this word, but I heard in a song, so I started Googling it to find out what you're actually saying. So um, that was a really, really, really proud moment for me. And a boom, scoop. The label works with artists, dancers, producers, anyone hoping to make music on their terms to incorporate cultural sounds along the way. Heard you searching me again. An opportunity Amradagan Vijayanathan has been waiting for. The artist, who's also known as Ami, is now incorporating his Indian classical music training. Just having Maja meant um, an identity that it came with. For the first time ever, I made a song that was completely produced by somebody and it was um, with another artist on the label, his name is Sean Vincent DePaul and it was Amnesia and that was the first time I ever experienced like real production, just different options that we have in terms of delivering the sounds that we want and I felt like it was such a liberal feeling. You know my way, you Vijayanathan says he didn't always feel like he had the permission to embrace his culture through music so openly. When I was in high school, like I would in my headphones, like I would listen to a lot of like Carnatic music. I'd listen to a lot of Tamil music, a lot of Tamil cinema music. Just the crowd that I was a part of, I wasn't. I didn't feel like it was welcomed as much as it should have been, and I so I always felt a little lost in places. It's all part of Noel Krithiraj's plan. He started the label with the hope of giving South Asian artists ownership of their music and inspiring young people and their families to see music as a viable career. You kind of grew up in this environment where you're always told to either become an engineer, doctor or a lawyer or whatever. So um, even though music, uh, arts in general, is a big part of our culture. Hear me? Okay. He says there may have been a time when it wasn't cool to listen to Tamil music because it wasn't associated with the mainstream, but says that's changing. Now that we've been here long enough um, as a community, you have friends and you know your kids are growing up very in an integrated fashion where you are now exposing your music to them and vice versa. And for kids who may be born here, who may not have the direct connection to the language um, or even the culture, now this is going to make them curious. And definitely they are going to feel comfortable to go explore it more openly. For Vijayanathan and Philip, they hope their music is going to help young Tamil people feel more comfortable in their own skin. I struggled so much because I felt like, oh, like I don't belong there, I don't belong here. In Tamil we say andara, right? You're always in the middle, like you don't know where, where to go. So I felt that when I was uh, much more younger and I first came to Canada, and I don't want the younger generation to feel that way. Kirtana Sassi there in CBC News, Toronto. And we want to hear how you are connecting to your cultural roots. You can get in touch with us through Instagram and Twitter at CBC Toronto or reach out through our website where you can also see all the stories in this series. That's at cbc.ca slash rediscovering culture. You're looking at a live shot of the Toronto skyline again. It's partly cloudy tonight with the chance of showers developing in the overnight. Temperatures are continuing to dip Currently, it's just four degrees in the city. Let's go back to Nick now with a look at your extended forecast. And Nick, definitely feeling the nights getting chillier. Yeah, we're seeing uh, temperatures through the overnight dipping below zero, and that's making for some slippery road conditions tonight. And it shows up in our weather headlines as the temperatures dip. We've got overnight flurries for the GTA. I mentioned earlier that some places outside the GTA 
could actually see a few centimeters of uh, accumulating snow. And then as we head through tomorrow and temperatures warm a bit, we've got isolated showers in the forecast once again. Now, in terms of the precipitation, there's a look at the map through tonight. As we head through the overnight period, this is what I'm watching here. Um, we could actually see a bit of a snow squall set up and with temperatures down around the zero mark, we could see some accumulating snows. And that's the same story all the way up around uh, Georgian Bay as well. Into tomorrow afternoon continues uh, again, switching over to some mixed precipitation though. For the GTA, generally just some wet flurries. Uh, switching over to some isolated showers through the afternoon continues into Thursday afternoon. Again, this is the one that we're kind of watching here. Uh, that's well outside of the city, but if you have travel plans that way, it will definitely affect you. And then into Thursday evening, the pattern begins to break up. So that is a look at the forecast. Now, in terms of the snowfall potential here, definitely a few centimeters of snow outside the GTA. What we're looking at is some of the higher elevations of Dundalk Highlands up toward uh, Collingwood. Those places could certainly pick up uh, some accumulating snowfall. Otherwise, trace, but definitely could make for uh, slippery road conditions. Now, gusty winds uh, continued through today. We're gonna see those peter out as we move through tomorrow afternoon. Lighter winds in the forecast uh, by the time we hit tomorrow afternoon and carrying on for the next few days. Overnight tonight, uh, zero down in Windsor. Again, some cloud cover. London, though, in surrounding areas where we're watching for those road conditions to deteriorate through the overnight. Uh, eight degrees tomorrow and a mix of sun and cloud across uh, the board. For the Golden Horseshoe, we're looking at temperatures down around the zero mark as well. Uh, some wet flurries across the city or at least some mixed precipitation. Same story into tomorrow. The risk for a few isolated showers through the afternoon. Now, temperatures drop again. Again, as we head through Thursday, so these are the two sorted to watch. Then we get a bit of an uptick uh, with the temperatures into the weekend. Weekend looking good, lots in the way of sunshine and a pair of nines. Thanks Calvin. so much. Thanks so much, Nick. And that is our show for you tonight. Thank you so much for watching. Dwight Drummond has your next local newscast tomorrow at 6. And I will see you back here tomorrow night at 11. Have a great night, everyone.